We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and we do have some extra copies. If you didn't bring one with you and you'd like one to follow along, just raise your hand up real high. And uh, we got somebody up here. I think we got somebody back there as well. Just keep your hands up till, uh, till somebody comes around. They'll be glad to uh, make sure that you've got one. A couple of her on this side in the front, too, as well. So, and I see some of you have parked yourselves in the warmth of the sun over there. Welcome to the Village Chapel Tanning Salon. Good to have you. Good to have you over there. If you need a little, if you're feeling a little bit uh, pale next week, you make sure to sit right over there. You should be just fine. We'll get you going with a little bit of sunburn, a little bit of suntan. And uh, we're starting the book of Acts today. So the Acts of the Apostles, if you want to turn there in your New Testament, sits between the giants of the Gospel of John and Paul's epistle to the Romans. So it's got a real interesting place there, doesn't it? And um, uh, it's about the, this, this uh, book, The Acts of the Apostles, will be uh, telling us the story of the, the early church, the beginning, the birth of the church, and the uh, spread of the gospel uh, around the Mediterranean throughout the Roman Empire. So it's really an awesome storyline as we, as we take a look back through history. Um, there are, of course, folks today who um, sort of shun the church, don't like the church, or might be staying home today because they think the church is full of hypocrites. And, of course, here at the Village Chapel, we freely admit that the church is full of hypocrites. And, uh, and, we, and we, the world is full of hypocrites, and so we're always, you know, pointing that out and just, just realizing that um, that's why we actually gather is because we, we, we seek to be transformed by this amazing grace of the God who would redeem hypocrites like us and sinners like us. So um, there are folks I know that you know and folks that I know, and maybe you're even here today where, where you, you've kind of had lately the disposition of heart where you just, you, you, you feel like maybe you're a spiritual person, but you hate organized religion or you, or you just don't like church or whatever it might be. And, um, and there are a lot of reasons why people uh, have been disappointed or have come to the place of disliking the church. Um, the, you know, the, the, the fact that we lose sight of our mission and our calling every now and then is, again, just a reminder that we need God so desperately. We need His, His grace and His mercy at work in our lives and the gospel flowing into our lives and lived out in our relationships and all that sort of thing. So the book of Acts is great because it helps us as we start to study it, helps us to a, a, ask and answer those questions. What was the church meant to be originally, and, 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 and what does it look like? Now, uh, some people, of course, go to the book of Acts and, and, and take it in, in a different way. They will say, we're getting back to being a first century church, man. We're going to be a New Testament church. We're going to be exactly like the book of Acts. And, uh, and what they mean, I, I think they have their well-meaning in some of that, but um, um, I have yet to be at a gathering of believers and to see, for instance, tongues of fire uh, you know, hovering over people's heads or or to, to, to be at a church service and have a mighty wind come rushing through. Although these used to not be actual windows. We used to just have, just have plastic up there, and occasionally a mighty wind would come, and you could see the windows bow and stuff. You hear it whistle. And I, I, I just kept, you know, waiting for the Spirit to come and, and do some good things, but it was really just the wind blowing, you know. Um, there are ways in which we want to be like the original church, the early church. There are other ways in which we don't want to be like the early church. Um, I thank God for air conditioning, but you're not going to find air conditioning in the book of Acts, okay? So we have air conditioning, so in that way we're different from the, the early church, and we probably will continue to have air conditioning as long as God provides for us to pay the electric bills and all that sort of thing. And we're glad to not be like the early church in that regard, that we're not sitting around sweating, and, and we'll, we'll read one story of a, a, a kid that was listening, sitting in the window of a non-air conditioned room, and the Apostle Paul went late into the night with his preaching. Evidently, he was long-winded. And uh, the kid fell asleep and fell out the window and died and uh, fell to his death. And then the Apostle Paul went down and everybody gathered around. They prayed for him and brought him back to life. I do not have that skill. Um, so if you happen to fall asleep over here in the sunshine or whatever, um, uh, don't fall too far asleep. We, we, I won't be able to resuscitate you myself. I'm not good at that. Um, this book is largely historical narrative. I think that's a good question to ask. What, when we go to study a Bible book, we want to know, since it's a library, the Bible is 66 books, some poetic books, some narrative books, some ancient letters written to an individual, some ancient letters written to a church, some ancient letters written to a group of churches. 
some of the, the text of the, of the Bible is commands and mandates and prescriptions that God is saying, I want you to live this way or I don't want you to live that way. And so we have a lot of different kind of literature in the library, I'll call it, that we call the Bible. Um, but the book of Acts, was about, it's about two-thirds historical narrative. Uh, we also have about 24 sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, eight by the Apostle Peter, nine by the Apostle Paul, uh, scattered others that are from miscellaneous different people. So that's the, that's the kind of literature this is. It's a historical narrative, and it's important that we understand God was doing something in space-time history with a particular group of people um, in, a, in a spot on the globe. And so when we read that, we'll be interpreting and applying that. And, and there are some timeless truths. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable in many ways. And so we'll look for those truths, but realize that historical narrative is largely going to be descriptive than prescriptive, more indicative than imperative. That means it's, it's describing something that happened, and, um, and it's, it's indicating something that happened. And so a lot of people that will make the mistake nowadays become sort of the modern-day Pharisee is to think that something that's described or indicated is something that's prescribed or imperative, a command for everybody all the time. We don't want to make that mistake as we read through the text. We want to see what it is that God would have for us to learn uh, in a timeless kind of way as we study the book of Acts. Uh, who is the author of the book of Acts? Best guess is that it's Luke, the fellow that uh, his name is on the third of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, okay? And um, that tradition and the view that Luke is the author of this book and that he has sort of a two-volume set, the Gospel of Luke and then the book of Act, the Acts of the Apostles. That tradition goes all the way back to uh, the Muratorian canon. Uh, some of you will see little references to that in the margins of your Bible. Um, the Muratorian canon gives credit to Luke as the author of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, as well, Eusebius, one of the early church historians from the third and fourth century, he credits Luke, a person named Luke, as having written Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. As does Jerome, one of the early church fathers, one of the first of what's called the Christian apologists. That's not someone who's apologizing for the Christian faith, but it's someone who's giving a defense of, either positive or negative defense of, the Christian faith, uh, or, or sort of giving reasons why you ought to believe the Christian faith is true. Jerome was that guy, also responsible for what's called the Latin Vulgate. He was the first guy to translate all of our scriptures into Latin. And um, as you know, that's you know, been handy down through the centuries to have the scriptures in a number of different languages. So what do we know about this Luke? If we accept the, co the more common um, or, or the more broadly accepted um, uh, speculation that Luke is the author of both Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, that it's a two-volume set. What do we know about the guy named Luke? We learn most of what we know about him from the book of Acts, um, that he was um, a companion travel traveler, for instance, of the Apostle Paul. Somewhere along about chapter 16, he moves from speaking in the third person plural, saying, and while they traveled around, they did this, and they did that, and they took this ship, and they went to that island. Instead of speaking in the third person plural, he moves to the first person plural. He says in chapter 16 or so, he, it begins what they call the we sections of the book of Acts, where he says, and we did this, and we traveled on this ship to this island, and we did that kind of thing. So it's interesting to note that the author of the Acts of the Apostles was an eyewitness to some of what he's actually telling us about. Um, Luke uh, is also um, uh, believed to have been a medical professional. Do we have any medical professionals in the room today? Healthcare professionals, raise your hand. We love you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, uh, Luke, in Colossians chapter 4, is called a, a, basically a doctor by the Apostle Paul. So that's an awesome thing to know that we've got a guy who's he's, he's smart in the ways of medicine. Uh, he's he's well-traveled. He's a seasoned traveler. Um, he writes, when you read the text, the, the book of of both Luke and Acts, you get the sense that this guy's a historian. He's, he's wanting to represent what actually happened really well. Um, and then as well, I think he's got a bit of a theologian in him, and he seems to highlight 
certain things uh, that are of theological significance, and he wants the readers to know about those things. We'll be pointing those out as we go along the way. So let's begin, but you know what let's do? Let's begin in Luke chapter 1 for four verses, and before we jump to Acts chapter 1. So would you turn there in Luke chapter 1? It's to the left, if you were already in the book of Acts. It's to the left in your Bible, not that far, but just a little ways, Luke chapter 1. And since we believe that this is a two-volume set, let's look at how he introduces volume 1. That will tell us a little bit about the intent, authorial intent of an ancient text like this is very important to understanding what was in the heart and mind of the author as the author wrote this book. And here we are so many years later trying to figure out how does this apply to us? Um, how much of this was true? How much of this was just fiction? How much of this was just speculation? How much of this did he actually know for certain or with some certainty, and therefore we can trust this historian? So look at, uh, with me at verses 1 through 4 of Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek name. It means lover of God or one loved by God. I hope to be both. I want to love God, and I'm so glad to know that His Word promises me that He loves me. That's wonderful. So he's writing to probably a friend or perhaps a patron. Medical professionals during that time actually had patrons. Um, he could have indeed been on salary with this guy, Theophilus. And so he's writing to his boss or his employer, um, to his patron, if you will, and he wants to tell him the exact truth about stuff. He said, so that you might know the exact truth, verse 4, about the things that you've been taught. Notice the careful, the multiple words that are used there to describe how much gr great care he carefully investigates things. Um, he's looking for eyewitnesses who've been there from the beginning, and he wants to write in consecutive order so that Theophilus, the guy that's signing his paycheck, might actually know the truth, not just kind of a myth, not just a saucy story. I mean, th th he's not writing for just to say, this guy isn't writing hoping that his book royalty check will be really huge. He doesn't have that in mind at all as a motivation, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that that's not his motivation. What's his motivation? He wants Theophilus to know the truth about what really happened, and in consecutive order, he's going to tell him the, 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 what he's found out as he's gone around and interviewed all these eyewitnesses, people that were actually there. And I would even argue in the book of Acts, now you can turn there to chapter 1, Acts 1, um, he himself becomes one of those witnesses to some of what he's writing what he writes in the book of Acts. So let's take a look then at the first eight verses, lest you think I'm going to keep you here too long and forever and that your tan over here gets too dark. I want you to know that's not going to happen. We're doing eight verses from chapter 1, and it's the, he references his first account. He says, the first account I composed, Theophilus. Oh, look, that's how we know it's volume 1 and 2. That's how we know it's the same writer. He's writing to the same person. Friend of God, lover of God, loved by God, Theophilus. The first account, that means this is the second one. So it's volume one and volume two, and it makes a lot of sense that it's Luke. Um, even though he doesn't, self, he doesn't say, this is my book, I, Luke, write you, Theophilus. Um, we just really have good, pretty good, I think, evidence for it. The first account it composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Began is an important word, you can underline that. The Gospel of Luke is about what Jesus began to do. The Acts of the Apostles is what Jesus continued to do through the agency of the Holy Spirit, through the Apostles, as Jesus, the work of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus continues to unfold in this world. Um, so the, the first account was about what Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. There it is, verse 2, you know? These are his apostles. The apostles mean the sent ones, the ones who were, the, the, the ones who were sent out, okay? Um, and so he's given orders to them. This is about what Jesus has done all the way up until the day when he ascended. 
To these, who? These apostles, these disciples of his that were his followers that became the ones that, that started the early church. He also presented himself alive after his suffering. So after Christ died, which is recorded in Luke's gospel, after he was raised again, which is recorded in Luke's gospel in volume one. He's following up on that. He says he's presented himself alive to these ones that he had chosen with many convincing proofs. Here's a guy that's thorough. Here's a guy that is reminding Theophilus of all that he wrote in volume one, that Jesus actually appeared to his followers. The apostle Paul, who's a friend of Luke's, will pick up on that in his letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes to the, the church at Corinth and says that Jesus appeared to some 500, actually more than 500 people after he had died, been buried, and was risen, had rose again. That after that, he presented himself alive to more than 500 people. That's quite a few people, actually. It doesn't take that many to get a conviction in a court of law. It doesn't take that many eyewitnesses to get a conviction in a court of law on, a, on an issue. And so the Apostle Paul says there's more than 500 people out there. And when he writes that letter to the church at Corinth, most of those people are still alive, so you could actually go talk to them. That's the idea, okay? So he's calling them eyewitnesses. Luke is referring to some of the eyewitnesses that he's talked to as well, who um, had Jesus appear to them with convincing proofs over a period of 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. That was always on Jesus' mind and heart, the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's the king. He's the king, I tell you. So the kingdom is always on his heart. It's always on his mind and his heart. And so um, gathering them together, verse 4, he commanded, Jesus did, commanded his disciples and apostles to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? The disciples were very focused on an earthly um, Messiah, sort of the, the idea of a political, socioeconomic Messiah. They thought that the answer to the world's problems were political, social, or economic in some way. Well, the answer to some of the problems in the world are political, social, and economic, but not, not the really deep problems of the world. If you could actually change the human heart if you could actually turn us inside out so that we no longer were self-oriented, self-worshippers, self-deifiers, where we actually joined God in his work wholeheartedly and gave ourselves away. And if you could change, man, that would change the world. And that's the kind of thing that happened in the book of Acts as we see the church get up on its feet and begin to, and the gospel goes around the Mediterranean, we begin to see that here is just a ragtag bunch of misfits, uneducated, unimportant people from a pass-through nation on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And somehow or another, God used them to literally turn the world inside out and change the course of human history. Did they do it perfectly? No. And we're going to actually see some of that as we study the book of Acts. But they're still... Um, faithful in the sense of they're going to do what he tells them to do right here. He commands them to wait for the Holy Spirit because Jesus knew they needed more than just three years in the seminary of hanging out with him. Um, he needed more than that. They still needed the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so he says they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, and it will be 10 days. So when they had come together, they were asking, Lord, is it now? Or is this when you're going to do it? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. If I had my map on the screen, I'd point to, I'd get my little laser pointer, and I'd point to where Jerusalem is over there in Israel. Um, some of us have been there several times, and wonderful. And Judea, I'd, I'd point out that that's the southern third of Israel, and that Samaria that's mentioned here is the middle third of, of Israel, ancient Israel. Galilee was the northern third, but it's not mentioned here. He jumps from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. Interesting, too, there, because the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. That's like the other side of the railroad tracks, basically. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples is, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem here, the center of all religious activity for Jewish people, but also in Judea, the suburbs, 
and also in Samaria across the railroad tracks where you don't think those you don't like those people and as well to the remotest part of the earth and if I had my little pointer laser pointer I'd point that over there I say that's Nashville <laughs> the remotest part I mean when you're in Israel you know the other side of the world is over here right so we're the recipients of the fact that this actually happened we, we, we're the ones who are blessed by the fact that this actually happened that these people actually responded to Jesus when he called them and sent them out to be his witnesses. So what do we learn here? Oh, there's a bunch of good stuff here. Um, in verses 1 through 8, first of all, we see that Jesus chose them. They are not self-chosen. They're not uh, seminary chosen. They're not synod chosen. They're not denominationally chosen. They aren't even non-denominationally chosen. Jesus actually chose these apostles. They'll seek him out on trying to replace Judas a little bit later in this chapter. We'll study that in the coming weeks as well. But it's, it's the Lord. They trust everything to the Lord. And it's about Jesus choosing, and I love this. Our Christian life, as John Stott said, began not with our decision to follow Christ, but with God's call to us to do so. <clears throat> he took the initiative in his grace while we were still in rebellion and sin. In that state, we neither wanted to turn from sin to Christ, nor were we able to. He came to us, and he called us to freedom. This is amazing. Um, for all of us, it's so important for us to hear this every now and then, that God took the initiative to come after us. Um, uh, a lot of times when we get uh, sort of full of our religion, sort of full of ourself and full of our religion, we tend to forget that it's God who took the initiative to come after us on this rebel planet. He came in pursuit of a people he could call his own. And the only choice that he had from everybody on the planet were sinners, every single one of us. But while we were running away from him, he came on a run for us. And he came to rescue us in his grace and his mercy, not because we deserved it, but just because he loved us. And he loved us first before we responded to him. He loved us first before we get our act together. Um, and so know that if you hear him calling your name, if you sense him calling you into a relationship with him, um, that's him doing that. He's taking the initiative. That's not me doing that. That's not, that's not even you do, doing some kind of self-talk manipulation. It's, he does that kind of thing. He calls people. And notice who he calls. The least likely you know? I mean, what was their res what was on their resume? I caught a lot of worms. I caught a lot of fish. That's pretty much what they got going on there. A couple of them, you know, I was a tax collector. I used to rob people, extort money from them. I, I, re I betrayed my own people as a tax collector and took their money and gave it to the Romans. One of those guys, Levi, who became Matthew whose name means the gift of God, who took his pen that he used to use to keep a record of what people owed him, and he used his pen to record how God had balanced the books through the work of Jesus um, and reconciled us to a holy God. It was Jesus who chose them. Secondly, in this passage, we see that it's Jesus. He appeared to them. Um, that's right there. Many convincing proofs in verse 3, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. This is awesome. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll reflect back a little bit more on that, but... Um, man, you know, you've heard the stories of his resurrection. You've heard the stories of how he appeared in the middle of a room that had a closed and locked door, um, that in his, in, his, uh, in his new body after being raised from the dead, he was able to do that kind of thing. Um, you, you, you read about in the gospel records, you read about him doing things like saying, here, you don't believe me? Touch me. Thomas is the one that said, unless I touch his hands inside, I'm not going to believe he's really alive, Right? because the other disciples had seen Jesus live, told Thomas about it. He wasn't there. He said, unless I see his hands, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus, instead of hitting him with a lightning bolt, said, okay, here, and appeared to Thomas and said, here, touch my hands, touch my side. And Thomas's response was proper. Lord, I believe. He just couldn't, you know, it's just overwhelming to him that God would be that gracious to him to provide him with the evidence that he so earnestly desired. Um, and if you're here today, too, and you're one of those people looking for a little more evidence, man, I'm going to tell you, you know, as we study these 28 chapters of the book of Acts, I think you're going to get a mountain of evidence about the resurrection. Those 24 sermons I mentioned earlier, almost every one of them mentions the resurrection of Jesus because it's central to the message of the gospel and the hope of the gospel that our God actually has reversed the worst, that our God actually can do that. 
changes everything. It's a game changer for us in this world where everything falls apart, everything gets old, everything decays or, or erodes in some way, and it feels like there's just darkness everywhere. Here comes the message of great news, great hope. Um, and so Jesus appeared to them, and that is he, just him, him being raised from the dead is amazing news. There's a guy named A.N. Wilson who's an English uh, writer and newspaper columnist. Uh, early on in his life, he, he, he had become a, a believer, gone to church. Then he, he got disgruntled with the church. Some of you may be like that, or maybe you were like that or whatever, and, and sort of disconnected from the church, disengaged with the church, and then literally flipped over to be calling himself an atheist. Okay? And then the interesting thing that happened is that this God who intrudes in our lives all the time, this God who breaks through, broke through his life, and now he's a believer again. Now, I'm not going to base my faith on somebody that's flip-flopping back and forth, but I think it's real interesting what A.N. Wilson said now that he's back to, to, to believing and, and hoping and trusting in his confidences in Christ. Easter confronts us with a historical event set in time. In other words, it really happened. It's historical. It's not a fable. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is amazing. Talk about that at Easter time. We're faced with a story of an empty tomb, of a small group of men and women who were at one stage hiding for their lives, and at the next were brave enough to face the full judicial persecution of the Roman Empire and proclaim their belief in a risen Christ. It was a game changer for them, just like it's a game changer for us that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Thirdly, um, Jesus chose them. Jesus appeared to them. Um, Jesus commanded them. What was the command? Don't drink. <laughs> no, 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 no. What was the command? Don't listen to that rock music. No, that's when I was a kid. That was when my, my sweet mother wouldn't let me listen to rock music very much, and and uh, now she's cool with it. Um, that's because that's I spent 18 years on the road playing some of that, so of course you got to love your son. I mean, you know, um, so, you know <laughs> proud of my boy. Uh, playing that syncopated music, you know, <laughs> that syncopated beat. Um, no, what was the command? The command of Jesus was this. It's almost as bad, though. Think about it. Wait. I don't like that command. Does anybody like that command here? I don't like that command. Never have. I don't like to wait. I like to do. That would have been a great one. Let's go. That would have been a great one. Uh, I, would I like those kind of commands. I'm Mr. Action Guy. You know, I want to go. Um, but his command to them is wait. We've been with you for three and a half years. Come on. We, we kind of know what's up. I mean, we, we, we heard the Sermon on the Mount when you first preached that. That was awesome. I got the DVD. I, got, I think you had the, It's awesome to watch that every now and then on my little home video player. Um, we have seen you raise the dead. We have, we're ready. Put us in. And how many of us are so overconfident, just like Peter? There's no way I'm ever going to deny you. I'm with you to the end. I'll even die for you. He probably couldn't eat chicken again after that, I'm sure. He had a hard time eating a chicken sandwich. <laughs> it looks like that thing. It reminds me of that thing. Um, what was the command? It's wait. Why? Because you need something you haven't got and you can't drum up. What is it? The Holy Spirit. So we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. He's mentioned 57 times in this book. 57 times. Can I get a charismatic amen? amen. Yeah. So the Pentecostals and Charismatics, you're going to love this book. We're going to rock. It's going to be awesome. But you might learn some things about the Holy Spirit that you, I don't know, might have to push reset. And just, you know, again, remember, we're going to be learning what happened in space-time history with the church as it got up on its legs. Um, but it doesn't mean it's always a prescription for something that's supposed to happen right now. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't, but we'll learn about that. But Jesus commanded them to wait. They needed the Holy Spirit. They couldn't be, they wouldn't be empowered to be his witnesses without the Holy Spirit. Um, stop me if I told you this. I don't think I did, but I remember um, an A.W. Tozer quote, which I'll paraphrase because I couldn't find it. I looked for it, couldn't find it. But he said something to the effect of if the early, if the Holy Spirit had left the early church, 95% of what the what the early church, the first century church, 95% of what they were doing would have come to a screeching halt. But the modern church, if the Holy Spirit were to leave the modern church, 95% of what the modern church is doing would continue on. Wow. 
and that's from the 1960s. Oh, it's changed since then so much. Uh, man, I don't want that to be true of us. I want the Holy Spirit involved, leading, guiding, empowering, illuminating. I mean, we just want to open our hearts and our minds and our, our wills. We want to surrender our wills to Him and just, just pray that He will be uh, working in our midst and through us as a church here in this city. Uh, Hudson Taylor was a missionary in China for some 51 years and a British Protestant fellow. He said, since the days of Pentecost, has the whole church ever put aside every other work and waited upon Him for 10 days? That the Spirit's power might be manifested? We give too much attention to method and machinery and resources, too little to the source of power. So true. I have to confess, I can actually, I, I, I know, I, I enjoy what I do, and, and I know that I have some natural gifts that God has given me, um, and I know that I can actually stand up in front of a bunch of people and talk and kind of make some sense sometimes. And I have to admit that I sometimes rest on my laurels, rest, just rest on that. Uh, I, it might be that I'm just running too hard during the week and I don't have as much time to be in prayer and, and to surrender myself before the Lord as I want to. Um, and I thank Him for His grace is always enough to make up the difference for my, my deficiencies. Um, but, man, uh, I want to be like Martin Luther and say, I just got so much to do today, I can't afford to not spend three hours in prayer. You know, I just, we want the Holy Spirit involved here. We want the Holy Spirit engaged with us. And we want what is being done here to be done in this power of the Spirit, not in the power of the flesh or just because we're naturally gifted at something or whatever. Um, uh, fourthly, lastly, I think this is just as important. Jesus commissioned them. He chose them. He appeared to them which in appearing to them, he's equipping them is what he's doing. He's saying, look, this is true, I'm alive. And you, you, by putting your faith, hope, and confidence and trust in me, you are trusting in the one who can actually reverse the worst, okay? And so he appeared to them for that. He commanded them to wait for the Spirit. They weren't ready, even though they had been with him for three and a half years. He said, now go, I'm going to send you out to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's the purpose of the empowerment of the Spirit. It's not just about a sideshow. It's not just about, you know, swinging the coat and wiping people out and everybody go, whoa, that's so cool, isn't that? Or it's not just about some alpha male getting up and, and, and trying to be the, you know, make the biggest church on the planet because he's an alpha male and he just knows how to, with his charisma, he's just got the ability to collect up people and, and, uh, and, and, and sort of have them drink all his Kool-Aid. Listen, do not drink all my Kool-Aid, okay? Be Bereans, be thinking people of faith. Read the word yourself and see if it's true or not, what you hear here, okay? Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and through his word, okay? I'll always encourage you to do that in combination because the Holy Spirit does not violate God's word. The Holy Spirit inspired God's word. And the Holy Spirit, if he's speaking to you and saying something to you, um, you know, I've had people come up to me before and say the most bizarre things they think the Spirit is telling them to do. And I go, no, he's not, because right here, he inspired it right here, and it says, no. <laughs> so you're being a fool. You're drinking your own Kool-Aid, and it just happens to be convenient for you or to help you dodge something that's uncomfortable that God's calling you to do or some sacrifice God's calling you to make. Or... You know, especially as followers of Jesus in a world that, um, unfortunately, isn't friendly to our faith all the time, sometimes it's going to cost us. Sometimes we're going to be the more minority view on something. Are you ready for that? Some of us aren't really ready for that. We're just going to cave every time the culture flow goes another way on something. And I'm not just talking about being obstinate for the sake of being obstinate. Listen, we are a peculiar people. The Bible tells us we're a peculiar people. But I know, and I know there are some Christians that are trying to be peculiar with a capital P. And, and it's just because they're trying to be weird. You know, they're just trying to be, or self-righteous in some way. Um, but we're not called to be that. But we are called to be his followers. And we're called to lovingly obey him. Um, to respond to this amazing grace that's been shown to us just by falling to our knees, lifting up the empty hands of faith and receiving as a gift what we can't earn or purchase, um, his gift of salvation. 
and transformation. And it really looks like something. And we're going to get to see that as we study through the book of Acts. It looks like a lot of something, as a matter of fact. Um, Elton Trueblood was a, a Quaker. Um, uh, he was the chaplain at Harvard and at uh, uh, both Harvard and Stanford, actually, at one point in time. Lived in the, uh, uh, like, 1900, ni- to, to, I think he died in 1994. But this, this little book called The Company That Committed is, it just meant a lot to me over the years. And um, I think if you want a copy of it, you've got to find a used one somewhere online. But he says, The Company of Jesus is not people streaming to a shrine. It's not people making up an audience for a speaker. It is laborers engaged in the harvesting task of reaching their perplexed and seeking brethren with something so vital that if it is received, it will change their lives. Every single one of us has a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, or a friend that is perplexed, that is in some way confused about what it means to know God and love God, or they're confused about their own life. They're holding on by a, just a spider skein thread. For, for dear life and for sanity. Every single one of us has got a friend like that or a, or a family member. Why so silent about the gospel? Why are we keeping that to ourselves? Ah, oh, the culture says keep your faith to yourself, keep your religion, you compartmentalize, you keep that. Who are you to tell me what to believe? All that stuff. And listen, all I'm going to tell you is that we're not supposed to be moral policemen, but we are supposed to be gospel paramedics. Good news, we carry it to wherever those broken people are. We are the EMT. We are driving it out to where they are. We're not to collect ourselves and just congratulate ourselves on the quality of our worship or our Bible study or how we dress today or what kind of cars we're driving or whatever, and then leave and, and forget about all this like it doesn't matter. No, when we go out there, we're supposed to be doing what Jesus wanted his disciples to do, his apostles to do. Send us out to be your witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth known as Nashville, Tennessee. Okay? And so we want to do that. We want to be gospel paramedics, not just just moral policemen handing out tickets and see somebody do something wrong. And that's what people have been doing for a long time. And I actually think that when I began this study, um, when I said there are people who, are, who hate organized religion, I think that's what they hate. I think they don't like moral policemen. I think they react negatively to that sort of thing. And you know what? I do too. I mean, I'll just be honest. But when somebody comes to me and says, do you know, Jim, the grace of God is more than enough for that thing you've been struggling with. When somebody comes to me and recognizes that there's, they see me, you know, in, in some confusion or, or some despair over the, the way the world is falling apart around us, when somebody comes to me and reminds me that God is sovereign, that he's still on the throne, that he intends to set things right, all things that are broken, he intends to set all of that right, that's good news to me. That's really great news to me. You have the good news. I have the good news. Let's join Jesus and join the apostolic you know, folks that down through the ages have been preaching the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Let's, let's join them and do all of that. He is, the Lord is so eager for us to be his ambassadors, his representatives here in this dark, cold, lonely, broken, dysfunctional, disordered, unraveling world. And here comes just this ray of light, poof, kind of just like that beam that's coming in, all right? Here comes this gospel message, this good news about Jesus, and how we can find our total identity in Him, not in our money, sex, or power. We can find everything we so desperately want in a right relationship with God. That's great news to a world that I think is hungry and hurting in so many ways. This morning at about 6.30, I was reading um, a little book, and I'm more the propositional kind of guy. I'm more the philosophical, theological kind of guy. I want the propositions. I want the logical, linear, logical argument and all that sort of thing. But every now and then, poets say something to me in ways that just nobody else can. And I was just reading this little Rainer uh, Maria Rilke quote, and that just took root in my heart, and I just had to close today with this. Um, he's, talking about God, or he's talking about God in this poem. You take pleasure, God, you take pleasure in the faces of those who know they thirst. Think of all the thirsty people. And I'm not just talking about physical water. I'm talking about spiritually thirsty people in your life. 
The Lord takes pleasure in the faces of those who know that they thirst. He's, he's eager for them. Um, you cherish those who grip you for survival. Um, you know somebody that's just gripping, just holding on for the last little bit. Um, don't be silent. Let's join the chorus of witnesses that Jesus and the, and the gospel, this good news, is really everything that they never knew they always wanted. And we want to share that with them. Um, not looking down our noses, but sitting across the table, uh, walking with them, weeping with them if they're weeping and in their confusion, um, just being there for them and loving them and, and sharing the love of Christ with them. Let's do that as a church here in Nashville and see if we can't join um, the spread of the gospel in our world. Thank you, Father, um, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that your purpose is to equip us and empower us to go out and be your witnesses. Um, I pray that in word and in deed this week, each and every one of us will have an opportunity that will become very real and present and clear to us that you wanted us to speak or you wanted us to serve or you wanted us to, to love or be compassionate to somebody whose life may be a mess, may be broken, may be running away from you at full speed. But Lord, you, you gave us that opportunity to be your witnesses and I pray that we would do that in word and deed this week that you would uh, set your church on fire with a holy fire, uh, that you would also radically transform our own lives, our own relationships, uh, so that our, um, uh, our greatest delight, our greatest joy is you, um, that we would live lives that exalt you because we exult in you. As we go from this place today, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.